Hey there, Nikki. Welcome back to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. As always, uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you and, and get caught up and, and hear your wisdom, your insights into math, math education in general. Uh, we've talked with you on the podcast a, a few times. We've had you, I think, Kyle, I think we've had Nikki at every single summit uh, that was... we've had over the course. So this will be the sixth summit coming up in November. And I think six years of, of you just giving so much amazing wisdom, Nikki. Uh, welcome back. You know, what's going on over here in your neck of the woods? What is going on in my neck of the woods? I don't know. We're over here. I'm doing a lot of different things looking at, um, you know, we still have so many kids that are, that are, have finished learning. Mm -hmm. Really looking and thinking about like, how do we catch kids up with their basic math? Right. How do we catch kids up with problem solving? I'm always telling schools, you want to move your scores? Do two things. Work on making sure all your kids at their grade level fluency at least and work on problem solving always. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing a lot of thinking. I just wrote a book on fluency doesn't just happen. Looking at multiplication and division with Allison Milo and um, Annalise Reckley. I love this right off the hop. You're giving people something big to chew on here, and and we couldn't we couldn't agree more with the idea that if students are not numerate, you know, if they are not fluent and flexible with number, with basic facts, that's addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and understanding the behaviors of these operations. It really does hinder their ability to do anything else, right? Because everything else is going to build off of those things. And I love how you've also articulated that problem solving is kind of why we want those tools, right? So it's not an either or, right? Because some people might push, you know, that, hey, we're going to do all these one these things and we're not going to do some of that stuff. But really, they go hand in hand and they're very, very important. So I'm super excited to dig in with you. And actually, John, we're going to have to go back and we're going to have to count up the episodes because I think Nikki might actually be approaching James Tanton for Ooh. one of our guests who's come on the show most. So we're going to have to get back to you on that. We should have done that ahead of this call, but I'm I'm super curious about it. But before we dig in, Nikki, you've shared before the math moment that you remember from growing up. But the question we have for repeat guests around math moments is what would you say is a math moment lately? That's either, you know, been on your mind, something that's maybe resonated with you or something that you feel is a really important piece that you'd like to share with the audience here today. Something I've been thinking about and that I'm actually writing about for one of my upcoming books is I was doing some high dosage tutoring. I believe in swimming in the pools that we talk about. I jumped in and I took two groups of kids, took a group of third graders, took a group of sixth graders and tutored them for 10 weeks, which is a typical round for high dosage tutoring. And I, those kids taught me so much. Hopefully I taught them some stuff too. There was one little boy who I will call Julio. Christine actually talked a, a little bit about this story in her Ignite presentation. I didn't see him. And Julio, he really gave me a run for, for my buddy. And I was doing it all for free. Boy, that boy was building lasers out of, out of, out of Mark. <laughs> yeah, I've been teaching for 35 years. I don't believe in kicking kids out of class. I've never have. Because I just believe you give up your power if you if you kick. I mean, if that's they're right. extraordinary, you know. But in general, that's not my go-to, right? I don't I don't send you down the hall. I, I don't send you to the principal's hall. You have to stay here, and we have to figure it out together. Oh, I wanted to kick him out of... <laughs> I wanted to kick him out of zoo. And I talked to everybody I could, everybody that would listen. And I finally came to the conclusion. I said, and I, I talked with Christine about it. Cause what I am is a reflective practitioner. I'd say of all the things, whatever I've learned and whatever I haven't learned, and we're learning every day, I'm a reflective practitioner. So I thought I really had to, you know, give myself a pep talk. I was like, Nick, you can't kick the boy out of class. And then at one point he refused to come. And then I was doubly insulted. I was like, how? And so what I learned from that, we went on and, and we worked it out because I changed. And I, I talked with the the one of the paraprofessionals and he told me, he goes, oh, he goes, Julio, that boy had trouble with everybody. He goes, he, he's got beef with his mama. 
<laughs> when he said he's got beef with his mama, because I thought, if you got beef with your mama, you you got something going on, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is not about this is about Julio. This is about me reaching into my teacher toolkit, way deep down into my bag, and pulling out whatever I need, stretching my own pedagogy so that I can reach Julio. Because the reason I'm even here is because Julio is here. I can't kick mm-hmm. the reason here out of yeah. the- So what it taught me was about building relationships and reaching those kids that are easy to kick out, right? By the end, I, I spent 10 weeks with Mr. Julio, and I knew it. I kept a journal on it. It was that impactful for me. I kept a journal on it, and then at the very end, I kept, kept putting postscripts. And at the very end, the postscript was, well, today was the last day of class. And Julio, I said, does anybody have any questions? And Julio said, yes, I do. I have a question. Can you tell me a little bit more? Can we go over coordinate grids again? And I thought, God, I like, got it. Right? You got them. <laughs> you got your hooks in there. And so it really taught me about the importance of relationships. Because you see, I've been doing a lot of research on relationships. I don't care what you know, and kids don't care what you know until you care. And and so I don't care what you're trying to teach kids, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, or problem solving. If if they don't think you care, they're going to show up as who they are. Julio didn't wake up and say, I'm going to go to session so I can lay on Dr. Nikki's nerves because that boy didn't get on my nerves. He laid on my nerves and did advanced yoga moves. Okay. <laughs> what is this mean? This what is this thing we call teaching? And I've been talking about this now for a couple of years, and people have been talking about it for, you know, ad infinitum. That the idea that teaching is about relationships, and if you don't have the relationships, you have nothing, right? That they talk in the research on math intervention, they say we actually should have a space. For relationships and be, mm-hmm. and do relationship mapping. Like, who does this kid have a relationship with? Yeah. Right? The great Rita Pearson said everybody needs a champion. Who is Julio's champion? And how am I going to show up for him in a different way? Because at first I was wrong. I was showing up as every other adult does in his life. Everybody's mad at Julio. And I was just showing up as you know, he was doing stupid stuff and I was mad about it. But then I, because I realized if I didn't change, I was never going to reach Julio. And it's yeah. about reaching Julio and all of those kids. Because the thing is, I was teaching ratios and unit rate and Julio cannot divide. They cannot multiply. So I had to accelerate and not go back and remediate and talk about stuff he was supposed to have learned in all these other grades. I had to accelerate, pull up what he needed for his grade level standard. Because that's one of the things that I truly believe in that I'll talk about in the session. All kids deserve to be taught the grade level standard. And as mm-hmm. teachers, we have to stretch our own pedagogy, which is what Christine always says. Christine Mulgrave King always says, stretch your pedagogy, right? Stretching our own pedagogy so that we can reach Julio. That we, he, Julio needs to learn unit rate. He is in sixth grade. I cannot go back and spend three weeks on teaching Julio how to divide the dick. I have to weave that in to the grade level standard as I'm teaching. Because Julio can learn, right? The other day on Twitter, I reposted in several tweets the stuff from, now I'm going blank on the name, but the lady that wrote about Accountable Talk and about how Resnick, how smart is learned, right? Smart is learned. And if I, if uh-huh. I really believe that smart is learned, if we as educators really believe that smart is learned, then what do we do differently? If I really, really, really believe that even though Julio is in sixth grade and he has managed to get there without any addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division, but if I really believe that smart is learned, then how am I going to teach Julio? You mm. see, I'm going to approach it different if I really believe that boy can learn, right? Mm-hmm. So when you ask me what is my most recent math moment, that is what comes up for me. But 
relationships matter, that all kids can learn. And we have to not just talk it, we have to walk it. And sometimes walking that path is not an easy road. No. Julio will do advanced yoga moves on your nerves. And you have to say, but this is about him. I'm here because he's here. I am going to keep the promise of public education. And I had some teachers from private schools say to me, we keep that promise too, Dr. Nick. We keep that promise too. I said, I know, I know, I know. As yeah. a, no. I'm a public educator, right? I've only ever taught public education. Me too. And I believe that. So I, I'm speaking from the point of public education, but I realize all educators that make this promise, right? The promise of public education is that we teach the public. Whoever walks through the door, whatever is going on with them, I don't care, you know, and I hate to pathologize parents. I don't believe in doing that. I don't care where they come from, what their zip code is, you know, what they knew if they never went to school, if they did, what their language is, what their gender is. I don't, I don't care about any of that. All I know is I made a promise 35 years ago to teach public school. And I want to always honor and keep that promise. And Julio reminds me, you made a promise to reach and teach him. So you mm. need to stick, you need to get with the program, Dr. Nikki Newton. You can't take that way out of class. What is wrong with you? It really made me really dig deep. Julio me some stuff. I'm so glad I jumped in the pool and swam. Because I rem it reminded me, you know, I'm a consultant. I go to schools. I work with teams. I do all that stuff. But it mm -hmm. reminded me of the swim, right? Because I was right there in the swim with Julio every week. Yeah. I think, like, your your epiphany, you know, about relationships, like you said, like, you you had to, like, wake up and go, like, this is why I'm here. And I think. I think there's still, and I had that epiphany as well. Like I, I didn't get into teaching, you know, the, for the, you know, and, and have that relationship focus. And we all have these epiphanies and I'm in the epiphany. I'm so curious about when we have the epiphany and when we don't, some teachers come in already knowing this, like, and this is really the goal is like, how do we make sure that that happens? Right. Because that is, is when we have that epiphany, that relationships are the priority, then Everything about your job just becomes so much easier, even though you think it's going to be harder. And so I, I want to kind of like pivot this to because I want to pair the relationship aspect of, of what we're doing in our classrooms with what you, you know, what you want to talk about at the summit, which I know is this. And I and, and specifically, I know how this relates or or how the, the relationship component can relate into how do we specifically teach about, you know, topics, topic specifics like teaching multiplication division like your your topic title in the summit coming up in november is teaching multiplication to been 10 must have tools yeah. and i'm gonna like i'm gonna go on a limb here and you're gonna say like it all is surrounded by relationship yes uh. well you're right and it's also about lowering students affective filter there's a story again about some sixth graders i was in cali and i was working with some sixth graders and they were in intervention and they knew that they were going to have a guest teacher and so I went in and, and the kids came in the room and the language that they were speaking was amazing to me. They were like, we're terrified. And they were using some other word. They're like, we're terrified. We just don't know what's going to happen. And we don't know how to multiply. And we're terrified. We fear you're going to be. And so the first thing I did was I just kind of smiled at him. I said, let me, I'm going to, let me help you. I said, this is what I promise. I promise you one thing. I promise you, this is before we started the lesson, I said, I promise you that I'm not going to show you anything that you've never seen before. Mm. They were like, huh. So they sat down and I pulled up a PowerPoint because I really, and I'll talk about this during the summit, I really, really believe in the power of pictures. So I pulled up pictures. They're like, oh. it's like, what do we see here? Getting kids to speak the language. We see three groups of thick cans of soda. How do we write that? You know, and the groups got bigger and smaller. And if, if, if that was an addition, if that was a multiplication sentence, what does it look like? If that was a division sentence, what does it look like? That's very different, right? Than just putting up naked numbers and asking kids to do uh -huh. stuff. So, you know, the power of visualization can take us so far, right? 
And so by the end of the lesson that, you know, their, their affective filter, which we usually talk about with, you know, English language learners or, you know, multilingual students just began to lower, right? Because they're like, I don't have to be afraid. I do see this. So I think one of the things I really want to talk about in the session is like, how do we lower our children's affective filter so they can even enter into the realm of, I am a learner. I am smart. I can do this. Mm. Right. And being fearful. There's so much fear. And I think we don't take that fear head on as teachers in our planning. What can we do in the planning of multiplication and division that lowers the affective filter where you get kids? Like when I'm teaching multiplication and division, I'll do things like I will. I don't tell the kids today. Today is the day and we're doing division. I tell the kids, you know, I was wondering, so there's, there's 12 legs and I wonder how many elephants there are. And then they're like, why did you say that? Right. You know what I mean? They can figure that out. If I put 12 right on the board and write that as an equation, kids are like, Oh, whoa, I don't know. I don't, I can't, I can't. But if I ask them a riddle, Mm -hmm. all melts away because now they're thinking about the riddle and they feel like, well, I know what Elvin looks like. But I'll do easy problems and then go to harder problems. So oh, there were 10 legs. How many flamingos were there? They know that. People say, oh, kids can't divide by eight. But if you say that they were spiders, you say that there's 24 spiders. I mean, you say there's 24. Too scared. Too scared to do it. Especially this time of the year when we're recording uh, in October. It's uh, Halloween it's month. It's coming in the house. I was just in a classroom last week doing this with some kids. We were talking about bullets and spiders. But then they, but then they, they, they figure, they, they begin to engage with the math because they're like, I don't know. I asked them something like, I said something like there's 96 feet. How many bats? And they're all trying to figure out how, then we can get into the math and like, are we going to draw those bats? Are we going to come up with some other models? And, you know, we begin to really talk about math and kids aren't afraid of that math. Because they feel like I can figure that out. I have everything I need to figure. You know what I mean? I love it. I what I'm hearing from you, and you know, even just in the examples you're giving, you're painting a very clear picture for everyone to get a sense as to what you mean when it when you say that we need to help students with their fact their fact fluency with understanding how to work with the operations that. You know, we're not talking about just naked problems and blind memorization. We are talking about doing all of these things to get students to essentially take what they know and apply it to mathematics and make these connections as we go along with so that the Math Moments community is going to feel very well connected here. So my wonder is, for those who are listening, you've shared a number of things here today that are really important. This idea of relationships is key, right? Yeah. This this idea of fact fluency being so important and problem solving because folks are going to be signing up for your summit session on teaching multiplication and division. And you've even mentioned 10 must have tools. What would you say would be the big takeaway you're hoping that those participants receive when they join you for our summit session coming up in November? Well, I want people, first of all, I you know, and you all know this. I want everybody to fall in love with the beaded number line. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also would like people to really reconsider the usefulness of the 10 row rec and rec for multiplication and division. And, and I would also, I'm going to sprinkle, just sprinkle the conversation with uh, some things about Montessori. Cause the see, Ooh. talk, the, talk of my game. I, I just feel like it's saying, like, in public school, we have made a very severe distinction. That's Montessori, and this isn't. And if you look at what we're doing, the that's Montessori stuff, the kids understand. Right. Dividing four-digit numbers with reasoning, and the fourth graders are like, what? Because totally. All right, folks, you have. Place value. Mm -hmm. If you don't do anything else in Montessori, you learn place value. And I think you do a lot of other things. But also, they have the addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division game wrapped up. Right? The tables that you use. The, uh, 
So I just want to sprinkle that in, get people to kind of think. Can't wait. What does it mean if we dare use any of those Montessori tools? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know what you you just spoke music to Mrs. Orr's ears. Mrs. Orr is a is a Montessori trained educator and been doing it for twenty something years. So so I'm going to tell her to come to your session and say get in there and get in there and listen to Dr. Nikki because she would just be she's going to join right in probably. Yeah. She's going to want to know all that. D Dr. Nikki, it's always uh, a pleasure talking with you. And I and I know that this was too short. And people listening right now is like, just just keep keep going. Just keep going. We're not ready to turn this off yet. We're going to bring uh, we're going to bring her back on. We're going to talk about guided tutoring, tutoring and uh, and some of the other things that uh, are you're passionate about. But in November, if you are listening to this right now, November 15th, 16th, 17th, you can catch Dr. Nikki live in her session on multiplication and division and 10 must tools. Head on over to summit.makemathmoments.com oh, yeah. and uh, get yourself registered right yeah. now. It's completely free, completely free for the weekend. Uh, and uh, you, could, you can join us in amongst many other sessions throughout the weekend. Nikki, thanks so much. We appreciate you and, and appreciate the, the wisdom you bring to the community. Oh, well, thank you. It's an honor to be invited to participate. Thanks, Nikki. Okay, bye.